All right, welcome to the first of its kind, world-changing manufacturers network. Lisa Ryan has her ears to the ground and her heart in the game. Get ongoing education and new connections right here with Lisa and the manufacturers network. Buckle your seat, listen, and spread the word. Here's Lisa. Hey, it's Lisa Ryan. Welcome to the Manufacturers Network podcast. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Jonathan Porter. Jonathan, a renowned supply chain professional, is the founder and CEO of Porter Logic, the supply chain stack for ambitious brands. As a Georgia Tech alumnus, Jonathan's expertise in warehouse management and industrial engineering allows him to help businesses navigate supply chain and inventory complexities and achieve their full potential. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Really excited to be here. So share with us a little bit about your background and what led you to doing with what you're doing with Porter Logic. Sure. So I started my career at Manhattan Associates, which is considered probably the top WMS provider in the warehouse software space. And Spent five or six years implementing warehouse management systems and so got really immersed in detail with supply chain and warehousing. And I just find it fascinating, honestly. Like, I think warehouses are some of the coolest things. There are so many processes that all have to come together for that box that you ordered online to show up at your door. And so many people don't understand how much goes into what we consider modern e-commerce. Yeah, I saw a lot of opportunity for efficiency improvements and just ways to do things a little bit better. Started the company coming up on about three years ago, but I come from a super entrepreneurial background and knew that I would always do something. I had side businesses in high school and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, timing was right and the market opportunity was there and we're really excited to be doing what you're what we're doing. So. Yeah, it is really fascinating. From a consumer standpoint, I drive by some of these huge Amazon warehouses in my area and just wonder, how do they find the coffee that I order that <laughs> can be there within a couple hours if I just order within the next 31 minutes? <laughs> it, it floors me sometimes what folks like Amazon and now others are also doing. Yeah, you can order in the morning and get it delivered a couple hours later, which we used to think two-day delivery was remarkable. But no, now they're, like I said, Amazon and others, but a lot of people are pushing the bar even higher. And it was interesting too, off the subject, but I was in the, in the car with an Uber driver driver the other day. And I guess Amazon has an Uber type app for their drivers for delivery. So we are seeing so many changes that even a couple of years ago, we would have never in a million years thought about using people in their personal cars instead of our beautiful company trucks to deliver products and to get them there that quickly. Yeah. No, it's amazing to see it, but at the same time, it's incredible that it's the technology that's powering a lot of this, right? You couldn't do this without a lot of the underlying technology that's powering somebody to log on to an app and receive a task to go do a delivery and it just it routes them directly to where to pick it up, directly to where to put it out. And um, that all has to seamlessly integrate with things like the warehouse management system and your order management. And it's just this orchestration of a lot of data moving back and forth that then is powering this consumer experience that m most people I've just mentioned, like most people don't realize what's going on. Yeah. You order something, you click buy, and you're mad actually now if it shows up two days later. You expect one day at this point, but yeah. And the number of people that have to end up touching that box, it has to go from a warehouse to a truck, to a train, to a ship, to another warehouse. It is a, it's amazing what's going on in the background. And in a lot of ways, we now see the pandemic has shown us just how critical supply chain is. Everybody realized very concretely, we couldn't get toilet paper. We couldn't get proteins in the grocery store. And it's now very much in the limelight or very much in the foreground of supply chain is critical and the technology is very important. Oh, absolutely. So how do you see the role of digital transformation and advanced technologies like IoT and AI impacting the supply chain? Sure. I'll be the first to say that I was a naysayer on AI until chat GPT, as much as I hate to say that. I'm a technology person. I'm, I've am i coded the majority of our product. And even I was saying, oh, AI is way overhyped. Yes, there's maybe something there, but um, we've seen it happen with a number of technologies in the past where people say they're going to change the world. Blockchain is a great example. And then but there's some interesting use cases around blockchain, don't, no doubt, but it really hasn't had this profound impact outside of maybe crypto and that industry. But 
AI and yeah, things that are happening with generative AI are really transforming the way that we do business. A lot of even our marketing materials, right? We're using chat GPT to at least write a draft. There's still usually a human layer that interacts, but it's just, it's, it's enabling things to happen in much quicker and much faster. And then especially you layer that into supply chain. There's just so many untold efficiencies that are coming out of automating things that were previously done by people. IoT is also really interesting when you get into supply chain, both on the transportation side as well as warehousing. Things like temperature sensors have been around for a long time. Companies are now starting to make those enabled to communicate with other systems. So that's interesting. But also things like pallet tracking. So in specifically in a warehouse, do, having digitally enabled pallets that know where they're moving instead of people having to go and scan a pallet to tell the system it's in a particular rack location or instead of a conveyor having to constantly scan goods as they go around, you can now have things like connected pallets and connected chips that go on the pallet so that you actually know where those are at all times. So it's just a, it, there's a plethora of use cases that have started emerging a lot because of things like 5G that's really enabling connectivity in places that we didn't have before. So it's really a number of factors that are coming together. I think AI is one of the really exciting flashy ones that comes to the front, but it's taking multiple technologies all coming up at the same time to really work in concert that's then empowering some of these new digital transformation initiatives. And just the speed of technology. I still remember when Google first started coming out and we're like, oh my God, ask a question and we can find the answer. And then when one of my friends got GPS for his car though, and the car was talking to us and now that just within the last couple months with chat GPT, yeah, one of my friends was like, let's just ask it to write this, whatever it is. And yeah, we do have the human to it, but you're no longer, you no longer have to look at a blank piece of paper. Yeah. You can have something at least give you that head start. And so the user friendliness, I think, of technology is what's really helping people to get over their fears and just try things and do things that even a couple of years ago, we would have never, ever thought that, yeah. that we could do as much as we're doing. Yeah, it's amazing you say that. I was just reading an article recently from somebody at OpenAI. It might have been Sam Altman, their like CEO, but somebody was talking about how they had the actual model and underlying technology for a really long time, but then they had to put a lot of forethought into the user interface. What was it going to look like for a person to interact with this technology? And that's, I think, part of why ChatGPT specifically has really catapulted. There's a number of these AI projects going on. There's a number of generative AI or companies that are doing AI art and all kinds of stuff. But that person and where the person interacts with the software and the technology, I think, is critical. And it's also part of why so many people are afraid of AI taking over the world. And I really don't think that it's going to take over in a lot of ways people expect, because there's always going to need to be some type of a human input. Now, that point at which the humans interact may change, right? We may have to learn as people how to work with technology in a different way or a different capacity. But at the same time, the, it's going to take a while for AI to fully replace that human decision making or that human input entirely. So what are some of the strategies that you're seeing that manufacturers can implement to ensure that seamless end to end visibility throughout their supply chain? Great question. Visibility is interesting, especially over the last couple of years, because so previously, let me Visibility first meant just knowing what was in your warehouse. That was step one, right? Or knowing what was in your supply chain. We saw though over the last couple of years, what happens when there's disruptions farther upstream. And so now the conversation is really about tier two supplier visibility, tier three supplier visibility. So not only just seeing what you have, but what do your suppliers have? What, have they, what is their demand even like, right? Are they going to be able to fulfill your demand given everything else they have going on? You see some really interesting things happening with predictive. So say you have a supplier that's in an area of the world where an earthquake just hit and there are systems that can actually monitor things like news outputs and start giving you predictive alerts around you have a supplier that might go offline soon. You might want to start mm. redirecting some of your demand. And it's it all comes back to visibility though. And really what we're meaning there is just pulling data into one place. It's as simple as that. You need something that's going to pull that together. You'll hear words like control tower, specific, talking specifically. So like a control tower is often a system that will sit on top of both your systems as well as other systems to pull data together. You can, you can build control towers with BI tools like Power BI or Tableau. Really, that's just a system to pull data together and do some aggregation. So then you can see 
whether it's in a dashboard or something visual, okay, here's all my inventory. Here's inventory that's in other places. Here's inventory that's on the water, right? Maybe you're pulling in container data or something so that you're actually seeing what's on a vessel, what's at a port. Being able to paint that whole picture too, I think is an important piece of it. Being able to see all of what you have on order, what you have in transit, what's shipped, but maybe not gotten to your customers. I think it's that's a piece that's now really started to flourish is pulling all of that data together in one place, whether that be a control tower or just another reporting tool. There's a part when I think about data that's like that, yeah, duh, of course we need data to be able to figure out all this stuff. But on the other hand, it's almost overwhelming as far as what data is the right data to have and how do you determine that? So what are some examples of how Porter Logic has helped manufacturers optimize their operations and their data collection, I guess, for inventory management? Yeah, that's a major piece of what we do, actually. Not only are we a warehouse and inventory management system, but also a native integration layer to pull data in and out of other systems. Specifically, think about, we have a customer that they're a retailer and they have 12 different fulfillment partners. So they're not doing any of their own warehousing or fulfillment. They're relying on third parties, 3PLs. And they needed a way to be able to pull all this data across company lines into one place. That's really where talking about tier two supplier visibility or the challenges, it's across company lines, right? How do you do that exchange of data? And you had technologies like EDI, which unfortunately are still around. They're <laughs> a little antiquated at this point, but being able to pull all that data in from a variety of different sources. So doing things like APIs, we read APIs from a couple of different systems, but also being able to just pick up emails. Like I know that's crazy and simple, but being able to pull an automated email or receive an email with an attachment that we can then process, that's something that our technology can do. And that allows us to pull in data from just all kinds of sources. So that particular customer I was referencing, all of their 3PLs send inventory data now into Porter Logic, and then they have a way to then log into their inventory system, again, into Porter Logic and just see all their inventory in one place. And the other major component of what our platform does is a low-code UI builder or a user interface, a screen builder, so that you can then build grids and charts and dashboards and interactive screens even. So you can be telling the system some data and it can be making decisions on that. And this particular customer, we built them like a network wide and then a by warehouse view. And then they have views into their kits and their finished goods. And so once you get the data in, you can really slice it in a lot of different ways. You can interact with it. So we do things like we push Slack reports to their marketing team so that their marketing team gets visibility into inventory, but they don't have to have full access to the system. They just need basic inventory data to run promotions and things like that. Um, we send pre preemptive alerts around low inventory and we do threshold checks to make sure if they are running low on particular items that maybe they have that in a different warehouse and they just didn't know that. And so we're correlating a lot of that in the background. So then what we're presenting is this concept of almost like managed by exception, right? The, your users don't have to look at everything. It's we're calling out, here's the five things you really need to focus on today. And that allows companies to repurpose a lot of the time that was previously being spent just homing over data, spent all in Excel sheets and just trying to wrangle all this together. Now you can actually do value add work. You can actually figure out, okay, here's my five problem areas. Here's where I should really focus. Here's where I should be putting my time. And yeah, it allows for all kinds of efficiency gains and just improvements in operations. So when it comes to this, if you have a manufacturer that's been around for a long time and may not have all the bells and whistles and technology that they need, how would they even know where to get started? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, a lot of the advice that we give to companies we're talking to is start small and start hacky, actually. So start in a spreadsheet, start with something that's simple and quick and dirty because you need to validate or try something new and see if that's even going to work. So for example, say you're a manufacturer and you do, you have a legacy ERP or you have some kind of legacy system that you just know is maybe not exactly optimal, but yeah, you're at that point of how do you even get started, right? It's this behemoth mm -hmm. of a project. Our advice often is to find a really painful small sliver. Maybe it's your returns processing. Maybe it's your food waste if you're like a food manufacturer or something, right? But pick kind of one very painful but contained section to really dive into. 
and then try things in ways that might not scale. I think that's one of the things that you learn as a startup, but that bigger companies and more established companies can really take advantage of is do some things that aren't going to scale initially. Experiment and try some things and do it in Excel, do it in Slack, do it in just really basic systems. And from there, if you find something that works, okay, then it's time to maybe automate it. Then it's time to go find a system for that. But initially, I think that a lot of companies spin their wheels by, okay, we know returns is a problem, so we need to go find a returns management system. And they spend months pouring through every RMS out there and trialing and proof of concepting and all that. When really their problem may be something completely different that's manifesting itself in returns. But if they'd done a lot of experimenting and trying, they may have identified mm -hmm. that the problem was really they needed a system that they needed a customer experience system to manage like the customer side of it, not as much the warehousing side of it. So in any case, just an example of where you can click in on one area, do a lot of trialing and experimenting to find out what the true root cause is and actually end up saving probably a lot of time than just trying to layer on and integrate some other system that you really don't know if that's solving your actual problem. Wow. So how would you recommend that manufacturers approach demand forecasting and capacity planning so that they could manage some of those fluctuations in production? Sure. Yeah. Demand planning is a really interesting topic right now because historically, the vast majority of demand planning and forecasting was based on sales, previous sales data, right? We would look at the last couple of years and we would run an average or a median and you would add some type of growth multiple, but that was heavily predicated on what your sales were over the last couple of years. That doesn't work right now, actually, because of COVID and the pandemic, demand has been all over the place and things like supply chain disruptions have caused demand patterns that don't accurately reflect consumer demand. So you may, your sales data may be low, but that might be because you were out of inventory for six months, right? And so you mm -hmm. actually can't rely on a lot of those historical models to do accurate demand forecasting right now. So the gist of it is you have to figure out a way to accurately figure out what that true consumer demand is. And so one of the tips that I give people is look at competitors. So say you're trying to launch a new blue t-shirt and you want to figure out how much or how much should you order now, given you're really ordering for six months down the road, right? That's another piece of this is you're always having to factor in lead time. You're always having to factor in manufacturing time. And from that point, maybe you look at a competitor that's also selling a similar blue shirt and you try and extrapolate how much are they selling? How much are, what is their demand for it to just give you some number of what that true consumer demand is right now? There's some other try things you can try with throw up a fake product on your website. Like that also sounds crazy, but if you're wanting to sell a new blue shirt, go ahead and put it on your website and just see what kind of demand you get in. You can always cut it off after 100 orders or something, right? But just see what is the time span that it takes you to get 100 orders of this new product. And that mm. can help you gauge what the true demand is right now, because that is what you should be planning on. I would advise companies that if you're trying to still use historic sales, there's some industries that were not very affected that it would still work for, but the majority of industries have been through some type of upheaval over the course of the last couple of years that makes your sales data not as accurate right now. So yeah, get creative, but look for that true consumer demand number, and that's what you should be planning and forecasting around. But it's something that just, when you were talking about that, it just reminds me of in my industry being speaking and training of how many times we develop this fantastic training program and find that there's no, that people don't necessarily see it as fantastic as we do. And so just coming up with it, I, I've come up with a title and a paragraph about something and that's, oh yeah, people are buying this. Okay. I should create it now. So it's the same type of mentality that until the market speaks, that's your clue to what yeah. you want to do. Yeah. One of the prime examples that I've read a good bit about is Dropbox. I, I'm going to fudge, I'm going to mess up the exact numbers, but Dropbox's initial concept was put into a three minute YouTube video that they posted online and they got something like 75,000 views overnight. And that's the kind of thing that like, okay, there's obviously something there, right? If that many people wow. are watching YouTube video. And so you can do some things exactly to your point. 
They're not expensive. They're not time consuming, but they're easy ways to validate. Is there some type of consumer demand there for consumer retail, consumer retailers, consumer manufacturers? If you're like selling, say you're selling apparel or something, right? Throw up an Instagram ad, see what comes back. Just some indication of what that demand is to your exact point before you put all the effort into building something. And then maybe the market's not there. It's much better to identify something up front. It's almost like what Kickstarter does, right? Think about all those projects right. on Kickstarter. People are pledging money against ideas that are probably not fully baked out yet, but it then allows those entrepreneurs and companies to take that initial, they can gauge demand. They can see how many should we build? What should we put into the product? And it's just, it's better overall to try and get some of those cues early for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We are not in the field of dreams, build it and they will come. <laughs> Which we were, right? That would just make everything. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to labor management, what are some sure. of the best practices to enhance that manufacturers can enhance their labor management and boost productivity through using some of these technology and automation solutions? Yeah, labor is another topic that the last couple of years has been really big, just especially in industrial settings like supply chain, warehousing, manufacturing. Keeping good labor has just become tough with you. The pandemic kind of threw everything off. And now, especially with layoffs in so many industries, and it's just a kind of time of upheaval for a lot for a lot of labor. So one of the really I, I find it super fascinating on the labor side, but uh, gamification. So it's a topic that's been around for a bit, but figuring out a way to incentivize employees to really enjoy their job. It's like, you're not entirely going to be able to compete on truly just like hourly pay, right? That is all, no, it's auditized in a lot of ways. And if you're trying to win that game, you're going to be nickel and diming and just that's a bad way to compete. So instead, try and figure out a way that you can actually build some things into your tech stack that make it your employees enjoy their work more and really want to come to work. So it can be simple things like leaderboards. You really don't even need a whole system for that, right? You could have a nightly report that pulls out of your WMS and looks at task data and then compiles how many cases each person picked each day. And that could just, you could send out a weekly report of, hey, this person picked the most cases this week and they're going to get a $50 gift card. Now, you need to put some safeguards around that. You don't want right. to be improperly incentivizing, right? You do you do want to make sure you're not incentivizing people to pick in a, in a improper fashion or something like that. But this idea of just using other incentivization methods besides just the compensation is something that has been around, but it's also really growing. So Amazon's super famous for it. They apparently have in their warehouses, there's like game modules where you can like for every box you pick, you move your car one step in a race against everybody else. So there's some really advanced technology pieces you can layer in. But you can also just do some quick and scrappy things too, right? Things like point systems. So for every box you pick, you get a point. And at the end of the month, you can cash your points in for a pizza day for your shift or something like that, right? Like just that kind of stuff. It helps people feel camaraderie and it helps people like you're not just going for a paycheck. You're going because there's this team and there's this more to it. And I think that's the kind of stuff that when you talk about labor and, and I mean, your question was around efficiency and productivity, but like everything I've just said feeds into that. Because if you do have labor that sticks around and that enjoys what they're doing and is incentivized in a proper way to increase efficiency, there you go. So if you right. can build a model around, you want people to hit this particular throughput, you want this many picks to happen every day, figure out some type of fun incentivization gamified model that then encourages your labor force to hit that. And is that something that you do with your clients is from the gamification or is it just what you've seen other companies do to incorporate? Because it's a fascinating thing. Like you said, you want to incentivize, but not make it so that they take shortcuts so that they make the money. So we keep up with the ethics of the game how would somebody even figure out how to do that? Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is there are definitely dedicated firms that can help you with this. One of our consulting partners is a labor specific firm that does what's called engineered labor standards. So they will come in and actually do studies around your particular processes and be able to tell you, here's what that person should be doing on a normal basis, not overexerting and not cutting corners to your point. Here's realistic targets based on industrial engineering practices and math under the hood and a lot of that. So there is a piece of that if you're really looking to put in a, a compensation model and an incentivization model that has a lot of this baked in. 
seeking out external partners that know what they're doing in that space can be very beneficial. You also, you do, I, I think that it goes in line with what I was saying earlier about try things first though. And so that right. is the, mo- try something in Excel or just something in Google Sheets, something basic, be upfront with your employees as well of, hey, we're trialing this new thing. If you like it, we'll maybe put in a more formalized model. But I think that level of communication, it goes so far in, especially like when we're implementing a warehouse project or or something, we will actively try and get folks from the warehouse to actually share their stories and experience because they're the ones on the front line. If at the end of the day, we're doing all this stuff with technology, it's still the person that has to go pick the box and put the shipping label on it to get it out the door. And honestly, that's one of the most fascinating things about supply chain and warehousing to me is it can't, it's not just technology. It's not just this system. In the end of the day, it's the physical manifestation of a person and technology working together to then get something out the door. Anyway, it, yeah, it's really interesting on the labor side of it, of like how you can put all this together to end up increasing your throughput. Yeah. I'll tell you in this program, I always like to talk about workforce, but the one thing that I have found that I am unable to get away from in any conversation is that focus on sustainability and being environmentally friendly. So how can supply chains do that while maintaining efficiency and profitability? Yeah, it's one of the things that I love seeing the most is that sustainability is finally a big focus in supply chains. I think, unfortunately, a lot of the way that global supply chains have operated over the last 50 years even has not been maybe as focused on sustainability, but we're really seeing a big push in that. And it's been happening over five or 10 years. It's not just brand new, but just the continued acceleration of focus on sustainability, I think is a huge win for the entire industry. Where my mind goes, and this is going to sound slightly counterintuitive, but near shoring of manufacturing actually can be a huge win from both in a sustainability standpoint, as well as a business agility standpoint. So Forever, the story was you need to manufacture offshore, you need to get into low cost of living areas where you're doing manufacturing. I think that now the big challenge there is then you got to ship it across the world. I know that sounds super simple, but the goods being in a container and on a boat or on some kind of vessel, that is a huge piece of the sustainability puzzle. And if you can eliminate that by putting maybe your manufacturing operations in a nearer location to your customers, right? It starts with where are your customers and then figure out where can you put in manufacturing that can be closer to that so that you can eliminate a lot of that transportation. Um, Again, don't quote me on the exact number, but it's something like 80% of your cost of a good is the transportation of it. And so from a cost perspective too, that's where this can really line up well, because not only are you eliminating the climate change impact of that ship having to go across the world, but then you're also saving costs by the quicker transportation. You're only having to put it maybe on a truck and a train as opposed to three different trucks and a port and a vessel and then a train and then this. And so you're eliminating a huge piece of that. It also can make you more agile because think about it. You may not have to order the same minimum order quantity. If you aren't having to ship it in a container across the world, you may have co-packing partners that are going to allow you to order much smaller sizes and you can test things quicker. You can order batches that are much smaller. So there's a lot of wins overall. And that's, I think, to the sustainability point, I think the way that sustainability really continues to accelerate is figuring out ways that sustainability can work in concert with all of your other business objectives. If it's just this extra thing you feel like you have to do, that's really not going to move the needle that much. But figuring out ways to incorporate sustainability into your other business initiatives, I think that's a really important piece. And thankfully, yeah, we're really seeing it in a lot of ways, nearshoring being one of them. Awesome. Well, wow, we have covered a lot in our time today. So if somebody would like to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Absolutely. So I'm active on LinkedIn. You can find me, Jonathan Porter. You can visit us, porterlogic.com, or you can email me, just Jonathan at PorterLogic. I love talking about this stuff. As you can probably tell, I find it just super fascinating. So yeah anyone feel free to reach out. And it's just, it's really fun to connect with other manufacturing and supply chain professionals that find this as cool as I do. Awesome. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm Lisa Ryan, and this is the Manufacturers Network Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Manufacturers Network Podcast. Do me a favor and share this podcast with your friends and colleagues 
so we can grow this network and connect more fantastic folks just like you. You can either send your buddies to the website at manufacturers-network.com or share the Manufacturers Network podcast on your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you and your industry friends hang out. The bigger and faster we grow the network, the stronger and deeper the community will all have. Thanks again, and I appreciate you.